Hello again, and welcome to the second video for the week. This is going to be on the Middle Ages, it's uh, Lesson 10. And I want to start with Christianity. There's going to be a couple of things to talk about. Christianity is going to be the first item. And the reason I put Christianity with the Middle Ages is because it has so much impact and so much influence on the way Europeans are going to operate during the Middle Ages. So as it says here, Christianity defines the European Middle Ages, but it began long before the Middle Ages began. Now, let's look at the foundations and tradition. According to tradition, Jesus of Nazareth was born sometime around 3 BC. And his teachings followed traditional Jewish law, and he followed the traditional Orthodox traditions with one major exception. Uh, he taught in his own name and not the name of Yahweh. So that was a big change compared to the rabbis before him and the Jews. <clears throat> he ends up disappointing many who were looking for a Messiah who would deliver the Jews from Roman rule. This is in the middle of the Roman conquest of the, the Middle East. And this became very evident that He's not the Messiah that Jews were looking for because Jesus preaches of a kingdom that was not of the earth. Uh, it says, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Basically, I'm not worried about what's going on. Now, <clears throat> Jesus taught the importance of love, the avoidance of violence. Uh, he also taught on the laws of Jewish customs and encouraged followers to obey the ethical meaning of the Jewish laws. <clears throat> now, there were mixed reactions to these. Uh, some were happy with them, some were quite disappointed. For example, we have the Pharisees who were strict observers of the law. Uh, they didn't like him because he taught him in his own name. He didn't follow the law. The Sadducees, uh, they combined traditional Jewish culture and this Greco-Roman culture together to make something new. And they had an issue because they didn't believe in the spirit world. They didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. And just like the Pharisees, they only believed in the Jewish laws. And then we have the Zealots. Uh, the Zealots were these violent revolutionaries. And they had a problem with Jesus because he was teaching peace and love and not willing to overthrow the Roman army or empire. Then we have Pontius. Uh, Pontius was the Roman governor of Judea. Uh, we weren't sure if he was real, if he existed until I think about a decade ago now when, it, when a, a plaster image of his was uncovered. But he didn't mind Jesus' claim of being the king of the Jews. He had no problem with that. What his problem was, was with the commotion <clears throat> being caused by the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the Zealots. So Pontius, he had an issue with all the groups who disliked Jesus of Nazareth. And the Romans were very, very worried about rebellion. Pontius thought that there was a rebellion brewing and the easiest way to stop this rebellion was to get rid of the problem. And in this case, the problem was Jesus of Nazareth. <clears throat> now, believe it or not, Jesus did not start a new religion. I know that's controversial. I know there are some people out there who have been taught that all your lives. And that's okay. But from a historical standpoint, Jesus did not start a new religion. He lived as a Jew, and he died as a Jew. It's really the resurrection of Jesus that becomes the foundation of the Christian religion. And it is Peter, who according to tradition, gives the first sermon following the death of Jesus. It is Peter who preaches that Jesus has died and risen to be with Yahweh. It is uh, Peter, who, who preaches that baptism marks those who accept the resurrection of Jesus. And it was Peter 
who begins this religion. And followers of Jesus and followers of Peter begin to spread this new religion throughout Asia, and they actively seek conversions to Christianity. And Christianity is going to expand very quickly. You've got Paul of Tarsus, who is really going to change Christianity from the small subsect of Judaism into a full-blown religion. Now, why is it the Apostle Paul who is going to spread this message the most? Um, it's really because he was comfortable in the Greco-Roman world. He had grown up in Greece. He had grown up in Greek society, and so he felt comfortable. And he was very comfortable speaking to crowds, both large crowds and small crowds. Now, there's some questions that have to be asked and some questions that have to be answered. One of these, were the non-Jews who converted to Christianity still subject to the laws of Moses? A Jewish Orthodox person has to follow the law of Moses. But if you're not Jewish, you don't follow that law. So can you become a Christian without first becoming a Jew? Do you have to accept both Christianity and Judaism? No, it's a big question. Was Christianity supposed to have different rules, different laws? Uh, was Christianity supposed to be separate? Well, Paul answers this by preaching that Jesus was the Son of God, that Jesus gave a new set of laws, and that Jesus' teachings were open to all. So in the end, no, you don't have to be a Jew to become a Christian. That was what Paul came up with. And this is also significant because Judaism doesn't typically seek out converts actively where Christianity is doing that. Now, the appeal of Christianity is very widespread. It embraced men and women. It embraced slaves and nobles. It was inclusive and welcomed all. And it created the sense of belonging and had these communal celebrations. Plus, there's the added benefit of promise this promise of salvation. So there's something in it for everybody. And many people also like the forgiving nature of the religion, as well as this idea of striving for a goal. Now, early Christians are going to be persecuted, especially in early Roman times. Uh, one example of this, 64 AD, I mentioned that the emperor Nero, uh, he, he blamed the fire of Rome on Christians. Uh, but there was another Roman emperor named Diocletian, who you may have read about briefly. He actively advocated for the death of Christians. He sought out and, and hunted down Christians. There were even some Romans who saw Christians as atheists and cannibals. Now, if you're curious about that, uh, if you're somebody who goes to church, you may have had communion, where you drink the blood of Christ and you eat the flesh of Christ, Romans thought it was real blood, Romans thought it was real human flesh. Now, eventually Christianity is going to become accepted, especially after Constantine I converts to religion, based on the events that happen at the Battle of Milby Bridge. Remember, he has a vision where he sees the sign of the cross, and he has the sign of the cross painted on all of his his uh, warriors' shields, and then he leads the battle. So it's Constantine who's going to make it okay to be Christian. Now, what is the Byzantine Empire? Now, what is this? Well, the Byzantine Empire is going to come about with the division of the Roman Empire into East and West. And that's what the Battle of Milvian Bridge is about, and, and the, the battle between Constantine and Maxentius. Uh, the Roman Empire is basically split into two, and that separation is going to happen officially at, in the year 395. So the East and West are going to exist simultaneously, at least for a little while, but the Western Roman Empire is going to come under more and more attack. It's going to be attacked in 410 by the Goths, and then in 476, the Roman Empire in the West is going to be defeated by a guy named Flavius 
Odysseus. He was a German barbarian. He overthrows the final true Roman emperor named Romulus Augustulus. And he declared himself the king of the Romans. Now, Rome doesn't just disappear. It's not like it's just beat up and destroyed. But that marks the end of a continuous chain of Roman direction or Roman rule. Now, the Eastern Roman Empire is going to exist for about a thousand years more. It's going to take on much more of a Greek-centric feeling. Uh, it's going to be very Hellenistic. People are going to speak Greek instead of Roman. People are going to eat Greek food. People are going to wear Greek clothing. It's going to become a Greek-run Roman Empire. The Eastern Roman Empire also had more people, more cities, more money. It was the better part of the empire. Now, the capital city is called Byzantium, and that's why it's called the Byzantine Empire. Uh, Byzantium was an old Greek city. It was burned to the ground, and then it was rebuilt in the image of the Romans. And when Emperor Constantine wins the Battle of Milvian Bridge, he's going to make Byzantium his capital city, and then his son is going to rename it Constantinople in honor of Emperor Constantine. Now, Byzantium, Constantinople, whatever you want to call it, it is Rome in a way. It has a Roman-style Senate, a Roman-style government, Roman-style laws, Roman-style magistrates, it's like they picked up the government of Rome and moved it several hundred miles to the east. There are really only two Byzantine emperors I want you to know. And the first one is Theodosius II, and the other one is Justinian I. Now, Theodosius II, he is the older of the two. He started his rule in 408 and went to the year 450. Uh, he's going to reconquer part of the Western Empire, and he's going to gather up all the Roman laws he could find and start to put them into an order that made sense. And he's going to give these laws to the, quote, barbarians, these Germanic kingdoms that surround the Byzantines, and that's going to help bring along peace between the Eastern Roman Empire or the Byzantine Empire and all the Germanic kingdoms. Now, Justinian is going to take those Roman laws and go a step further. Uh, he is going to rewrite the laws into what is today known as the Justinian Code. Uh, in the Justinian Code, it, it has three parts. Part one is called the Digest. I'm sorry, part one is called the Code, part two is the Digest, and part three is the Institute. The Code is the actual law where all the Roman laws are written down. The digest, that is uh, like academic writing to explain how the laws work. It's done by jurists, it's done by lawyers, and it's done by judges that explain how to use the code. And then finally, the third part, the institute, it's the textbook used to train people, especially law students, on how to operate the law. So you get the law code, you get a sample of how the law code should be interpreted, and then you get a textbook that teaches the law to you. Another interesting thing about Justinian, he had a wife named Theodora, and Theodora convinced Justinian to give women some rights, and Theodora very often worked with Justinian, who basically worked around the clock. Christianity is going to become extremely important to the Byzantine Empire. The Hagia Sophia was built in 537 BC, and it was actually the largest church in all of Christianity. This is a picture of it right here. Uh, it was located in the Byzantine Empire. It was in Constantinople, and of course Constantinople now is Istanbul. And when Constantinople was conquered by Islamic forces in the 1400s, the Hagia Sophia was turned into a mosque. And today it is one of the holiest sites in Islam.
but it's also still a, a very important site for Christianity. Another occurrence that happens during the Byzantine Empire is the First Great Schism. This happens in the year 1054. And this is where Christianity breaks into two branches for the first time. You end up with the Orthodox Christian Church and the Catholic Church. Now, ultimately, this fight was over which of the Christian bishops was the most important. You have the Bishop of Jerusalem, Antioch, Rome, Alexandria, one, two, three, four, and there was another bishop and the Bishop of Constantinople. Uh, eventually, the Bishop of Rome. Now, this fight that created the Orthodox of the Catholic Church is all about what type of bread it was used, as well as which of the bishops was more important. The Bishop of Antioch excommunicates the Bishop of Rome. The Bishop of Rome excommunicates the Bishop of Antioch. And it's about should bread rise or should bread be flat? And then who has the power of the Pope? Who speaks for the Holy Spirit? And before you know it, Christianity is split in two. And you have the main Catholic branch. And then you have a secondary Orthodox branch as well. Now, there are some questions on the Byzantine Empire, whether it's the continuation of Rome or if it's something new. And there are arguments on either side for this. Uh, if it's something new, uh, well, it's located where Asia and Europe meet. It's no longer in Rome. They're speaking Greek. They're not using the Latin. And they're seen as other by both people in the East and the West. They don't really fit in. But the argument for it being part of Rome is that they're using Roman laws. It's, they're using the Roman government. It is a direct descendant of Rome. And it was originally part of the Roman Empire. Now, you can ask five different historians what they think, and you may actually get five different answers. But moving on from there, we have to actually get to the Middle Ages. And first of all, the Middle Ages, what is it? It's the period of time from about 500 to 1500. And it includes the breakdown of Roman power in the West. It includes the strengthening of Christianity in Europe. And it's this creation of this new society that's based partially on Roman ideals, partially on Christianity, and partially on Germanic, quote, barbarian society. Now, what set Germanic society apart? Well, it's not an ethnic group, first of all. It's a cultural group. It's people from diverse backgrounds that kind of live a similar way. Uh, there are fierce warriors. They're not well organized. And there are three different social classes. You have the nobility, you have free men, and then you have these non-free, non-slave people known as serfs or peasants. That's another word for it. Now, generally speaking, the Germanic people, they're great eaters, great drinkers, they gamble, and they get their prestige through war. And these warriors actually get fan clubs. Uh, you might've seen this in some movies best movie I can think of that's kind of old now is called A Knight's Tale of Heath Ledger. Heath Ledger is one of these warriors, one of these knights. He wins jousting battles and he ends up getting a fan club that follows him. Now how does Christianity fall into this? Because I just spent a lot of time talking about Christianity. Well, Christianity, it grows in acceptance after Constantine accepts the religion. And it's broken down into three parts. You've got the people who are seen as the believers. You've got the priests who are seen as the servers. And then you have the bishops who are seen as the teachers. And as I said, there are five bishops. There's Jerusalem, Antioch, Alexandria, Constantinople, and Rome. And Rome is eventually going to be seen as the first among equals, which leads to that great schism I just talked about. Now, why has Rome become the greatest, the first among equals? It's because Rome was arguably the greatest city on earth at the time. Now, early Christianity is based around the monastery, and monks are the ones staffing the monasteries. Monasteries, they have no families, no business ties, and they devote their life to the Christian God. 
And these monasteries are also going to become the repository for knowledge. It's where the books are held. And it's where knowledge is collected and copied within Europe. And Christianity, it's going to become the glue that holds Europe together in many ways. It's not just a religion, but it's also going to function as a government as well. So monks live in monasteries, and monasteries are going to collect books and collect knowledge. There's this guy named Charlemagne. He's also known as Charles the Great or Carolus. And he's going to become the king of the Franks in 768. Now, Charlemagne, he inherits the throne from his dad. His dad's name was Pepin the Short. And he's going to put together this kingdom that stretches from modern-day France all the way to modern-day Poland. And this is the first large-scale government in, in, in Europe since Rome falls in 476. Now, Charlemagne, he's a pretty well-rounded guy. He's a warrior. He's a politician. He's a patron of religion. He's He's a fan of education. He makes sure that his children learn how to read. He makes sure that his children learn how to write. And he's very high on education. Uh, however, at the same time, he prevents his daughters from marrying because he's afraid that somebody is going to steal his power. Now, his empire, it's based on this idea of decentralization. It's all about personal relationships. Charlemagne would travel throughout his kingdom. He would visit the wealthy. He would encourage people to support him. And he would ask what he can do to help somebody in exchange for them giving him his, their loyalty. Charlemagne gained so much power that in the year 800, the Pope crowns him Holy Roman Emperor. Which is funny, though, because Charlemagne, he's not holy. He's not Roman. He's not an emperor. And uh, Charles or Chuck, as we'll call him, because we're good friends. Um, uh, Charlemagne never uses that title himself. He just sees himself as the king of the Franks. And the Byzantine emperor sees himself as the Roman emperor. So that caused a little confusion sometimes here and there as well. Underneath Charlemagne, uh, there's this event called the Carolingian Renaissance or Carolingian Renaissance. Uh, Charlemagne is going to reform the church. He's going to create a new version of the Christian Bible, and he's going to add liberal arts to education. Um, he's also going to invent this writing style called Carolingian Minuscule, which, believe it or not, you use every day. If not for Carolingian or Carolingian Minuscule, you would have to write in capital letters at all times. Yes. Charlemagne is the one who simplified our writing system to allow for lowercase letters. Mixed in with all this, we have feudalism. Uh, feudalism is going to become the basis of European life for hundreds of years. Um, in feudalism, you have a lord who gives land to a vassal. So imagine that you have a huge thousand, 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 maybe even a million acre piece of land, and you give part of that to somebody. Well, that somebody that you gave your land to becomes a vassal and you are their lord. That's literally where the term landlord comes from. Uh, that vassal who you've given land to, they agree to give you protection and to give you tax money. And the top lord is going to be the king because he gives away the most land. Now, the vassals, they can turn around and give away some of their land as well. So you can be a lord and a vassal at the same time. The land that's controlled by the vassal becomes known as a manor. And in the manor system, the serfs or the peasants, whatever you want to call them, they work the land and they can be pressed into military service as needed. Uh, the peasants, they had to pay taxes. The Lord owned the land. Now, this is where things get messy. These peasants or these serfs, they're tied to the land. They are stuck on the land, but they're technically free. That's what I mean by non-free, non-slave. Uh, kind of think of it like the serfs being rocks or dirt in the field. Uh, you can't really remove the dirt from the field, but you can sell the dirt. So it's kind of this, this weird place where you're not a slave, 
but you're not free. You're you're just stuck on the land. Now, the Middle Ages, we separate more. Uh, I mean, we've got a period within the Middle Ages that we call the High Middle Ages, and this is going to be from about 1000 to 1300. And this is really marked by the creation of cities. Uh, cities are going to become incorporated during the High Middle Ages, and that means that they're going to have a direct relationship with the king instead of with the local board. Now, you have to pay for that privilege. The town members, they'll pay the local lord for any revenue he's going to lose and then they have to pay the king directly for the right of incorporation. Now, it's really expensive to incorporate. But the reason you do it is because it gives you the power to control your own affairs. And it gives you the power to control your own laws. Another part of these incorporated cities is the establishment of guilds or trade groups. And that allows groups of people to make their own laws or their own rules as well. We still have these today. If you've ever heard of somebody who is an apprentice or a master, uh, that's part of this guild system. And there are actually three levels to it. An apprentice studies with a master for several years. Then you have a journeyman who works for a master, but he can work without the master's supervision. And then a master can own a business and a master can teach apprentices. Now, some places where this is used today, carpentry, plumbing, welding, uh, electrical lineman work, electricians, you name it. They still use this apprentice journeyman master system. Another big part of the High Middle Ages is the struggle between church and state. Um, the church, the Catholic Church, it's become very powerful by about the year 1000. And it runs not just like a religion, but like a government as well. But at the same time, we have local kings and local lords becoming extremely powerful also. And then you would have lords who give land to the church for monasteries. And in exchange for giving land in the church for monasteries, they think that they should be able to control what happens in the church. So the lords, they, they want monasteries on their land because it makes them look better. It gives them prestige. It gives them honor. Plus, it gives them a place to doff the poor off. Because it's the church's job to take care of the poor and the sick. It also brought money into the area because people will will go to these churches from long distances, tourism. So these lords, they want the church on their land, but they want to control what happens there too. At the same time, the church feels that they should have control of the monasteries. The church says, you gave the land to us, and we answer to a higher power. We're churches, we are doing the work of the Christian God. We're we're not worried about political matters. We're doing spiritual matters. And this struggle between the church and the state is going to come to a head in the early 1000s because the Holy Roman emperors are going to attempt to control the bishops. Now, after the Roman emperors attempt to control the bishops and the popes, um, we get this investiture controversy and this formation of separate spheres of influence. It's decided that the Pope would have control of all matters concerning salvation in heaven, and the kings would have all political authority over matters on the physical earth. Now, there are three teachers that you need to know, and make sure that you look at these because they are on the text, I guarantee it. You have Anselm of Canterbury. Anselm of Canterbury uh, he teaches that one's intellect can observe the world and understand God. Because people can imagine and perceive the existence of a greater being, then that greater being must exist. And the only greater being that could be is the Christian God. So Anselm, he says, all you have to do is look around, observe the world, something 
or someone great had to create this world, and it only makes sense that it's God. Bernard of Clairvoy, or Clairvaux, I should say, uh, he teaches that logic can be used to enhance spirituality. That if you think logically around the world, or about the world around you, that it will lead you closer to the kingdom of heaven. And then finally, you have Peter Abelard. And Peter's going to believe, you know what, you don't need logic and religion. You can teach logic without religion. And this freeing of logic from religion is what creates and leads the way to modern university. And we have to talk about the Crusades. You might think that the investiture controversy solved the problem between church and state, but no, it, it did not. Um, the Crusades to go from 1095 until 1271, when the last one happens, there are multiple Crusades, but there's not just one. And the origins to the Crusades really happen way back in the late 900s. You have the Seljuk Turks who are going to take over Jerusalem. And even though, on paper, Muslims and Christians are supposed to get along, the, the um, Turks don't really play nicely. The Christians, they're going to be taxed so that they feel uncomfortable. The Byzantine emperor is supposed to protect these Christian pilgrims going to Jerusalem, but they aren't able to do it anymore because the Byzantine Empire just quite simply doesn't have money. So the Byzantine Emperor is going to turn to the Pope and ask for help. Now the Pope sees this as his chance to prove, hey, I can be in charge of both spiritual issues and physical issues. And Pope Urban II, who was the Pope in 1095, he calls for a crusade to liberate the Holy Land. Now there's something in this for almost everyone. If the church raises an international army, it's going to show the Pope has political power and spiritual power. If the kings go along with it, it's going to show that the kings can get rid of troublemakers. The kings can get rid of unruly knights who don't listen. They can get rid of these second sons who won't inherit any land, and they can get rid of peasants who can't pay their taxes. Now, the first crusade goes fairly successfully. The Pope's army is going to manage to take Jerusalem. The Pope's army is going to manage to take Christian kingdoms and set them up throughout the Middle East, but they're all temporary. They don't last. Now, in total, from 1095 to 1291, there are nine crusades. Some of them are more successful than others. Some are more famous than others. The third crusade is known as the King's Crusade. And the third crusade goes from 1189 to 1192. Now, why is it called the King's Crusade? It's because it has King Richard II of England. It has King Philip Augustus of France. And it has Emperor Frederick Barbarossa of the Holy Roman Empire. And by the way, this third crusade is the crusade happening during the Robin Hood stories. Uh, the long story short, King Richard II, King Philip Augustus, and Frederick Barbarossa, they go to battle. Frederick Barbarossa dies. King Philip Augustus and Richard II have an argument and Philip Augustus goes back home. King Richard II makes it to the Holy Land. He makes a deal with the Muslim armies led by a guy named Saladin. And then he starts to go back home. And when Richard II gets to the Holy Roman Empire, he's kidnapped and captured because they think it's his fault that Frederick Barbarossa died. In reality, Frederick Barbarossa just couldn't swim and he drowned. Well, the whole Robin Hood story is situated around Prince John taxing the, the poor and giving to the rich, you know, the Sheriff of Nottingham and all that. What was really happening is King John had to raise money 
for the ransom to get Richard II free from prison. Another famous crusade happens in 1212. It's the Children's Crusade. Uh, children try to march to the Holy Land to fight for Christianity, but instead they are just sold into slavery. Now we have cathedrals. Cathedrals are like the ultimate symbol of the Middle Ages. Uh, in fact, during the 1100s, there's more stone quarried out of the ground than was quarried in all of ancient Egyptian history, just in that 100-year period. Between 1180 and 1270, in just about a 100-year period, in France alone, there are 80 cathedrals and 500 abbeys, which are like miniature cathedrals built. Now, why do they do this? Well, most of these cathedrals are built in towns, and they're going to be used to show off wealth. And they're all made extra beautiful to you know, show off the wealth and beautify the area surrounding them. And they also had competitions between cities. For example, Notre Dame uh, was built in 1163, and it was 114 feet tall. Uh, the Cathedral of Chartres was built in 1194, and it was five feet taller, 119 feet tall. And then the Cathedral of Beauvais was built in 1247, and it was 147, I'm sorry, it was 157 feet tall. And it was so tall that it was taller than what the, stru the structural integrity could support. And it collapsed multiple times because the engineering of the day didn't match the dimensions of the building. Now there are two types of cathedrals. There's a Romanesque cathedral and a Gothic cathedral. Romanesque cathedrals are older. Uh, they have round arches, they have thick walls, they have stone roofs, and small windows. The picture on the right is a Romanesque cathedral. So they're older, round arches, thick walls, stone roofs, small windows, and they're actually cathedrals as well as fortresses. They're war buildings that double as churches. So they're small, they're dark, they're cramped on the inside. The only way to light them was with candles and the windows were small so that arrows and fire couldn't be shot in, but you could still shoot out. Gothic cathedrals, like the one on the left, that's actually a picture of Chartres, they have pointed arches, they have large stained glass windows, they have tall ceilings, and they have these things called flying buttresses, which are these braces on the outside, these decorative braces that are used to hold up the walls, and that allows for taller construction. Now, the first Gothic style cathedral is Saint Denis, and that's built in the year 1144. Now we have the late Middle Ages to talk about. And we have the Black Death. Now the Black Death is actually caused by a disease known as the bubonic plague. And it travels from Asia into Europe in the year 1347. Now, it's not a brand new disease that's been around for a while, but in China, it had different symptoms. In China, it was more like a very, very bad flu. Uh, it travels along trade routes from China to a city called Jaffa, J-A-F-F-A, or sometimes Kaffa, K-A-F-F-A, and it was located on the Caspian Sea. And the city of Kaffa was surrounded by the Mongols. The Mongols wanted to take the city and the leader of the Mongol army would load dead bodies onto catapults and catapult the corpses into the city. Well, they didn't know it at the time, but the people had died because of the bubonic plague. Shortly before the city fell, some Italian sailors, or traders, you should say, from the city of Genoa, 
they get on their boat and they escape, but they don't realize that they've already been infected. By the time they get to southern Italy, almost everybody on the ship is ill and dying. And they're taken off the ship. Doctors try to help them. And there's just nothing they can do. Now, the, the disease begins with a painful boil on a lymph node. Basically, your lymph nodes start to swell up. And you have lymph nodes everywhere. You have them behind your ears. You have them behind your knees. You have them in your armpits. You have them opposite your elbows and your wrists, in your, your nose, in your, in your throat. They're everywhere. And these boils, these lymph nodes start to explode. And grow. Now, if the boil is lanced open and drained, you have a very small chance to survive. And when I say small chance to survive, it's less than 10%. If that doesn't happen, though, if you do not get yourself opened up, then you're guaranteed to die. Now, the victim bleeds under the skin. The lymph node basically like liquefies and, and you start to bleed under your skin and you turn black and blue from all the blood. Uh, you start to cough up blood and you go delirious from such a high fever. There's evidence and there's writings of people jumping into lakes, rivers, water troughs, trying to stop the fever and actually drowning from it. And you typically die two to three days after you show your first symptom. So it's a very fast-moving disease. Your chances of getting the Black Death was about 90%. So nine out of every 10 people die. And then of those nine people, it's a 70% death rate out of those nine. So basically six and a half out of nine people, seven out of nine people die. We used to think 25 million people died from the Black Death, but modern research has shown that that number was probably closer to 60 million. To make it even worse, the plague changed forms. The, the bacteria started as a, a blood-based disease. It was transported or transmitted by fleas. Well, eventually it becomes airborne, where all you have to do is cough or breathe on somebody, and it is deadly. Now, the bubonic plague, the one that has to be spread just by bodily fluids, 50 to 70% fatal. Septicemic plague, which infects the blood system only, 100% fatal. Pneumonic plague, the one that affects the air, 100% fatal. In fact, the Black Death or the bubonic plague was still fatal all the way up until World War II when the first antibiotics were established. Now, why was it so deadly? It, it's so deadly because of our immune systems. There was no resistance to the plague. It hadn't been seen in Europe in over 800 years, not since ancient Greece. It became pneumonic, meaning it became airborne, which hastened the spread, may spread much further, much faster. It became easier to spread from person to person. And the people were hungry, the people were poor, which meant that they had weakened immune systems and they could be affected easier. And then just the overall state of the, of the towns and the villages and the buildings, uh, if you use the bathroom, you use the bathroom in the corner, in a bucket and then you poured that bucket out in the street and it wasn't very sanitary. Now, what were the reactions to the plague? Uh, first of all, this is a plague doctor and at the end of this beak, they would put either sweet smelling flowers or something else that would mask the smell because they thought the smell was what caused the bubonic plague. Um, so that was a plague doctor outfit. 
Now, what were the immediate reactions to playing? Well, the church is hit extremely hard. Uh, for a Catholic, one of the expectations is to be read your last rites, which is basically your final confession on your deathbed. Well, usually on your deathbed is when you are the most potent, you're the most virulent, and so the disease was spread very easily to the clergyman. People also look for somebody to blame, and there were a group of people called the flagellants who would walk around Europe with whips, and they would hit themselves in the back, hoping for forgiveness. But what it really did was it gave them open wounds, which helped spread the disease. Either they got it or they themselves were infected and they splattered blood everywhere. Other people reacted with parties. Hey, it's the end of the world and I feel fine. Religion, hey, it's the end of the world and I need to get right with God. Or hey, it's the end of the world and I'm gonna become a hermit and stay in my house. And the long-term effects were a little bit different. Survivors are gonna get better land. They get more land. The land is sat for a year or two and it has regenerated and people are gonna do better on what land they have. Lower population means more food and the fact that there's more food means that they start to get healthier. Wages go up because there's a labor demand. People aren't willing to do work for the low prices they did before. There are even peasant revolts. There's a peasant revolt in England and there's a peasant revolt in France. And also, marriages happen earlier after the plague to try and repopulate and because there were fewer women, there was more competition. So the plague is a real defining Point or a defining event in the Middle Ages. Now, there really, there's one more event about the Middle Ages. Uh, that's the Hundred Years' War. But I like to cover that along with the Renaissance because it really kind of leads into the Renaissance. So I'll cover that next week. Now, the last thing that I want you to see is the class schedule. So let me pull that over real quick. Just to put this into perspective, we're right here on week six. We only have two weeks left of the class. So by next Monday, you need to make sure that you've done discussion nine, discussion 10, and quiz 13, and reflection, reflection paper number three. Reflection paper number three can be on ancient Rome, it can be on ancient Greece, Islam, Africa, or the Middle Ages. Any of those things you can do for reflection paper three. But I also want you to see the research essay is due by 726 and the museum is due by a 726. So you really need to be working on those two items so that you can get the highest grade possible in this class. Now I have made a video about the research paper. Uh, I've explained the museum review in the introduction to the class and in the email. But if you have any other questions about the research essay, if you have any other questions about the museum review, please do not hesitate to ask so that I can help you get the, pos the highest possible grade in the class. All right, if you sat through all 50 minutes of this, that's almost one hour, I would like to give you a little something as a thank you. So if you make it all the way to, this is minute 49 of this lecture, send me an email saying, I watched your entire lecture and I will give you some extra points on whatever your lowest quiz grade is in the semester. We'll say five points on whatever your lowest quiz grade is. So once again, if you watch this entire lecture, this 49 minute lecture, and you email me and say, Mr. Kennedy, I watched your entire lecture on the Middle Ages, then uh, I will give you five points on whatever your lowest quiz grade is for the semester. All right, I look forward to hearing from you, and we will talk to you soon. See you later. Bye.